Does this work better? Perfect. Welcome everybody to this lecture entitled Nano Engineering Our World and Ourselves. And the purpose of this lecture is to inspire you. My name is Wouter van der Weengaard and I work with micro and nano systems. And that means that my team builds very small things. I will get back to the title a couple of times throughout this speech to interpret what actually what it means. Nano engineering. The word nano here refers to nanometer. And a nanometer, that is a billionth of a meter. So you have a meter, a thousand times smaller is a millimeter, a thousand times smaller is a micrometer, and a thousand times smaller than that is a nanometer. And this word is a little bit confusing because we typically use this word not only for the nanoscale, but also for the microscale. So I'm not going to talk only about the nanoscale. I'm going to talk about structures from the nanometer up to the micrometer scale, up to the scale where you actually can see something with a naked eye, 0.1 millimeter. That's the limit of what we can see. Yeah? So the focus of this lecture is to talk about biology and technology, where the micro and nanoscale structures defines function. If we talk about nanotechnology today, we see that this word is used in a lot of different application fields, many engineering fields. You see here on the top, it's used in medicine, electronics, in energy, in materials, space technology, food packaging, uh, engineering, etc. But most importantly, perhaps, is in nanostructures that we see around us are in biology and nature. So every single part of our body and every single part of an organism is nanostructured. I will take a closer look at one engineering application and then at biology or nature itself. And I pick this specific application because I think that nanoelectronics is perhaps the most pervasive use of nanostructures in our world today. And biology, of course, because it's also pervasive everywhere. And this is going to be the first part of my talk. Talk about what do we see today in our society. The second part of my talk, I will talk about what we are doing in our lab today. And the third part of our talk, I will try to look ahead. What can nanostructuring and nanoengineering bring us in the future, perhaps? Talking of electronics and biology, we can already reinterpret our title here by adding two small words. Electronics is about nanoengineering our dry world. And biology is about nanostructuring our wet selves. Electronics is what we all use every day. We live in a dry environment in air. Air is dry. And that's why we use electronics. And electronics and water, they don't go very well together. I used to have a PhD student, her name was Chianti, and she tested several times to drop her telephone in the toilet and fish it back up and try to make it to work. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. Our wet selves, well, our entire biology is water-based. The reason for that is that life came, of course, from the ocean. It evolved in the oceans, and that's because water is a perfect um, solvent for uh, biochemical reactions, and so life emerged from the oceans, and when life moved to land some 400 million years ago, we had to take our water with us. So our bodies are maybe 70% consisting of water, and all the important processes and structures in our body are still water-based. And this is going to be interesting um, to compare these two type of structures and how they relate, or what you can do with them. <coughs> Let's look a bit closer at nanoelectronics. What you see this image here, this is an image of an integrated circuit. It's a piece of silicon. A silicon chip, electronic chip. And this type of electronic chips form the computers around us, and computing is everywhere. Computing is the base of the internet. It's the base of all our telecommunications. Uh, it is the base of all automation in industry, and of all robotics. It's, our cars are full of electronics. And even your dishwasher machine or your laundry machine at home probably has more computing power today than the Apollo 11 rocket had that brought the first people to the moon. Yeah. We have computers everywhere. Let's have a closer look at specifically cars, just to get, take one example. You see an image of a Tesla car, and this is an image here, you can see this is the supercomputer on the top here, this is the supercomputer that Tesla has uh, developed, and they released this image just two weeks ago, and they claim that this supercomputer will be able to steer their cars totally, um, totally automatic. And such a computer board is typically maybe the size of 30 centimeters of size, I can estimate. And of course, it's full of 
electronic chips, CPUs, for example. You can see here two big electronic chips sitting here, several centimeters large. But there are several orders, others here sitting that are much smaller. And these CPUs can be down to maybe 100 micrometers in size. So we have a size scale between typically here centimeters to 100 micrometers. This is the scale of CPUs. And if you would take a close look at these CPUs close by, typically on the scale of a micrometer, you'd start seeing that these, these are full of little electronic circuits that are interconnected with little metal wires, typically the size of a micrometer. And if you would zoom, zoom in even further, down to the scale of 10 nanometer, 5 to 10 nanometer, you would see the transistors that are sitting underneath these metal wires. And the smallest features today that are commercial are typically 7 nanometer, there's a 7 nanometer node that refers to this gate oxide here, this black line is a gate oxide that, that is between the gate and the transistor channel that controls the, the chips. So this is the scale in which we engineer electronics today. And if you go much smaller, just like 50 times smaller, you're at the scale of silicon atoms. So this is a STM image of silicon atoms and they are spaced typically 0.1 nanometer. Yeah. So this small features here, it's only a couple of tens of atoms thick. Very small. A car does much more than only computing, because the car needs to see what is around it, so it needs sensors. And what is a sensor? I had a colleague, Niklas Vidin, an uh, old PhD uh, companion of mine, and when he was teaching students, he used to explain the sensor that is the other side of the internet. So everything that got into the internet, that became an electronic signal, had to be put in there. And how do you convert a physical signal into an electrical si signal? You use a system that is called a sensor. And a car is full of sensors, of course. So a modern car typically has 100 sensors in it. And here you see some ex examples of sensors in a car, like lane departure system, rain detection sensor. Uh, you have uh, uh, tire pressure sensors. You have uh, the sensors that trigger the airbags if you have an accident, uh, an accident et cetera, et cetera. And these sensors, they typically look like, if you would find them in your car, they look like little boxes, a little bit undescript. But if you look underneath, you can see they're full of electronics and also typically of micro-mechanical systems. For example, this is a view here on the top right. You see a view, a zoom-in view of uh, the individual pixels of a night vision camera. So if one of these little silicon plates that are hanging here, if an infrared photon falls on it, it heats up that plate just a little bit, and that's enough to change the resistance, and then you can measure that. And then you detect, okay, I have a photon falling on this sense, on this pixel. On the top left side, uh, the top right side for you, uh, or top left side for you, you see a, a typical pressure sensor, and pressure sensors very often look like flat balloons. So you see the top side and the bottom side of the balloon, and if the pressure in the tire changes, this balloon is collapsed or engulfs a little bit, and that change of this diaphragm here that can be measured with the strain gauges here, and is converted to an electrical signal. And this type of technology, we call that microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS. And these systems are typically of the scale of 10 micrometer. Yeah. And so you see you have maybe one supercomputer, but you have several CPUs, several MEMS sensors, even more transistors, and even more silicon atoms. And the, the, the reason why I put numbers here this is the amount of components you find typically in a car. And I only illustrate that to show that the smaller a feature is typically, <coughs> sorry, the, the smaller you have uh, the size of a feature, the more of it you have. Let's look at the nanostructuring biology. The smallest scale that we can still see with a naked eye in an, in an organism is on the scale of uh, 0.1 millimeter, and that's typically the size of a hair. So the hair on your head typically has a size diameter of 100 micrometer, and you can still see that. If you go smaller, it becomes difficult to see with the naked eye. But what happens if we go 10 times smaller, now we're on the scale of 10 micrometer, there we find cells, the cells that build every living organism. Cells are typically of a size 10 micrometer, 20, 30 micrometer in diameter. And we as human beings, we consist of typically 40 trillion cells. That is 40,000 billion cells build our body. Remember that number, okay? 40 trillion. We are also full of bacteria on our skin. There's billions of bacteria on our skin, but especially in our gut, several kilograms of bacteria in our gut. And it's good that we have them because they are the ones that help to, uh, to digest our food. Without our bacteria, we may not live very long. And the amount of bacteria has been estimated recently, has been re-estimated to be about the same as the amount of cells in your body. So for every cell you have in your body, there's also bacterium living there. So if I talk to you as a person, I talk to a zoo, you know. You yourself, but there's also like 40 trillion other living 
creatures inside you. If you go eat that, and the bacteria, of course, they're the size of a micrometer, typically between half a micron and two micron size. If you go much smaller, now we're in the scale of 100 nanometer, that's the scale of viruses. Viruses are typically in the size 20 nanometer to the very big ones to one micrometer, but typically 100 uh, nanometer. And the image you see here, this is the image of an influenza virus. 100 nanometer diameter. And it's a very beautiful image because you can see very detailed structure. You see on the envelope of the virus, you see these little dots here. These are proteins, individual hemagglutinin proteins. So if you talk about influenza, you talk, for example, influenza H1N1. The H stands for hemagglutinin. And this is the protein that will make sure that this virus can infect your cell, the cells in your body. And you also see this spiral-like structure inside. This is the RNA strand in the virus that will help the cell to reprogram other virus particles. Which brings us to another scale down. Now we go to 10 nanometer scale. That's the scale of proteins. And this is an STM image of proteins. And in particular, this protein is, here is an ion channel protein. It's sitting on the, on, the, on the wall of a cell or on the, on the membrane of a cell. And it controls the flux of ions, for example, calcium ions, through such a pore. And this protein can conform. Either it's open and then the calcium can flow through, or it closes and it, it blocks the calcium flow. Or, or potassium or whatever ion it is it controls. And if you go even smaller, we're on the scale of DNA, one nanometer size. And this is also, actually also an, an uh, STM image of DNA, where you can see actually the, the spiral structure we produced. And if we go 10 times smaller than DNA, we're at the, sco the scale of individual atoms again. So this is the scale of biology. This is our scaling in biology. On this slide, I show the biology on the top and the scale of engineering on the bottom. And now, interestingly, we can compare biology and engineering in terms of function, design, fabrication or synthesis, and materials, and see where do they differ or where, where are they alike. When we start with function, function of electronics today is very much focused on maybe sensing something, if you have a sensor here, or information processing in computers. And all of that, is, it does it with electronics. But it's not so much function, actually, in, in, in the nanostructures that we make ourselves. If you compare to life, our bodies, the nanostructure, to start with, it forms a mechanical structure of which you consist. It's a mechanical function. You can sense. The sens sensory organs in your body have nanostructure. You can treat information through typically ionic currents to your nerves and in your brain. Also through molecular uh, molecules in the, in the blood will communicate. You also have actuators, which is that you can not only sense things, but you can also, uh, your information in your brain can be converted in movement. I can control my muscles. These are actuators. I also have energy systems and so on. And all of that is built out of this nanostructure. I would actually structure on every scale. So we see biology is much more functional than anything we can engineer today. In terms of design, electronics, we design top-down, we engineer, we decide this is what we want to build. Biology is not designed, it has evolved. And function emerges as systems evolve. Cells have a certain function, but then they stick together to form a tissue, and the tissue has, again, a very different function than individual cells. Very different approach to design. Fabrication of synthesis, electronics, we're going to take a silicon wafer, put it in a machine, make a vacuum, deposit a layer, use photolithography to make small structures, top-down vacuum-based processing, dry processing. Life is a bottom-up self-assembly of water-based biochemical molecules. Yeah. Very different way of making things. And if you look at materials, the biggest difference between engineered materials and biological materials is probably in the stiffness. So, for example, electronics, we see we have stiff materials as semiconductors and metals, a stiffness over gigapascal. The human body has very soft tissues. The brain has a, uh, a stiffness of typically 10 kilopascal. So there's like a one million time difference in stiffness between materials. And so now we move to the second part of the lecture, what we are trying to do in my lab. We're trying to combine these two worlds, biology and synthetic structures. And hopefully, then we can bring together the function from both and the design aspects and fabrication and materials from both worlds and combine them and do novel stuff that we could not do before. I will talk about four examples of research we're doing in my lab trying to do that. So now we're going to talk about nanoengineering ourselves or wet cells. Um, what you make if you put a, bio a biological entity and a non biological entity and integrate them together, we call that a biohybrid structure. 
And if it's on an organic level, on the level of a human being, we call it a cyborg or cybernetic organism. And there's a number of cyborgs sitting here in the audience, I'm sure. People of you that have a, um, a pacemaker, for example, you are a cyborg. If you have a hearing aid implanted, you're a cyborg. If you have breast implants, you are a cyborg. Yeah? So we use that actually today to enhance ourselves in some ways. Uh, but in our lab, we work not on the macro scale, we work on the micro scale. And the first example I'm going to talk about is on the scale of the hair, 100, 100 micrometer, where we will make small particles and you do cell micro encapsulation. What we're doing is we make these particles with a diameter of a hair. They're little plastic balls. They're actually, the inside is a hydrogel here, the light gray part is a hydrogel, and the darker gray part is a harder plastic, a polymer. And inside these light dots, these are living cells. So we take living cells and encapsulate them inside little particles. And why we do that, I will show with the next movie. So. So first, maybe the person you see here on the top corner, this is Chianti. This is my student that tests electronics. She also makes this nanoparticle. That's actually what she does most of the time, making these microparticles. She's behind most of that research. And so what specifically we're trying to do here is to make cancer drugs. We want to make local chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is one of the few ways we know how to hopefully cure cancer or stop cancer. And how that works is that you inject. So the person that has cancer, you inject a toxin in the person and you hope that that toxin is more toxic for the cancer than for the other cells. Yeah? Because otherwise you die. But it's toxic in any case. That's why people, for example, lose their hair under chemotherapy. So what we're trying to do is instead of having to give a systemic dose and only having it work in a tumor, for example, in the brain, no, we want to create a drug inside the tumor in the brain, for example, only create a drug in that point and only have the working inside the tumor and have much less influence on the rest of the body. And that would allow us to give a much higher dose of medicine to the patient without killing the patient. And so what we do is we make these particles and then the plan is to inject those, actually to implant those inside the tumor. Typically 10,000 of these particles could be enough. And they sit there, they do basically nothing until we inject in the patient a prodrug called iphosphamide in this case. And this is a prodrug, it's a rather harmless, uh, rather harmless chemical and it flows through the blood and it does nothing unless when it re reaches these particles. And inside these particles, we have these human cells. You can see these little white blobs inside this blue-colored gel here. Every white blob is actually a living cell. And these cells have been genetically engineered to produce a specific enzyme. And this enzyme is, is cytochrome. And what that enzyme does, it, it, it takes this iphosphamide prodrug and it converts it to a radical, a chemical radical, which means a very reactive uh, chemical substance that attacks the tissue immediately surrounding it, which is the tumor. So we got a very local tumor, working, uh, tumor drug. That was the first example. A second example is 1,000 times smaller. Now we go from the scale of a hair to the scale of 100 nanometer, typically, where we make hybrid structures of DNA and gold, typically gold nanowires. And here on the left side, we see a cartoon of this, where we see a DNA strand here going through the pore of a porous membrane to the other side, and on top of that DNA strand, we have coated gold. See that? On top. And on the right side, you see an actually an electron microscopy image of such a structure, where you can see three holes in the porous membrane. Each hole is one micrometer in size. That means this is the size of a bacterium. 
and we have put uh, DNA on top of the surface of this membrane and then stretched it through the pore to the other side. And then we have coated that DNA with gold. And what you see, the red colored structure here is the gold structure you see. You can't see the DNA, it's underneath. But you see the gold structure on top and you see one, two, three gold wires on top here that go from one side to the other side. They're 300 nanometer in diameter. They're the size of a virus, typically. And now, why do we make such structures? Well, we do that to make extremely sensitive biosensors. Detecting DNA is of interest in many diseases. For example, DNA can tell you, DNA from a bacterium can tell you if the bacterium is resistant to a certain drug or not. In cancer, the DNA could tell you whether your, cell, whether your cancer cells rea will react to a certain drug or not. So we're interested in knowing, uh, in fast detection of DNA strands. And also doing that very sensitively. And so we made a sensor that allows us to electrically detect DNA of a concentration 790 zeptomolar. Now, zeptomolar is probably a term that most of you don't know, so let me explain what it is. Molar is a measure of concentration. One molar means you have one mole of substance in one liter of solvent. So, this, the liquid we probably know best is seawater. Seawater is water with salt. And seawater typically contains half a mole of salt in a liter, per liter of water. So that gives you an idea. Yeah? Seawater is about one molar, half a molar. But we work with zeptomolar. So what is a zeptomolar? So you have a molar, and you go 1,000 times smaller, millimolar, 1,000 times smaller, micromolar, then you have nanomolar, then you have picomolar, then you have femtomolar, then you have atomolar, and then you have zeptomolar. It's 10 to the minus 18th of a molar, actually. It's very little, OK? So what we're doing, we are detecting, we have volumes of, uh, of big droplets of liquid, and they only contain a few DNA strands, but we can still detect them. And I will show you shortly how that works. So you see, this membrane, it's only 10 micrometer thick, and it's coated with a gold layer on the top and the bottom. And the strategy that we're following is, what we want to do is, we want to capture a DNA strand, hold it on both sides, and measure electrically, is it there or not. Yeah? There's two problems. First, the DNA strand is typically 50 nanometer long. So how do you capture a 50 nanometer thread flowing around somewhere with two electrodes? Very difficult. That's the first problem. The second problem is DNA is not conductive, or very badly conductive. So even if I can capture my DNA, probably I can't measure it because there's no current going through it. So we need to solve these two problems. Capturing the DNA is the first we solve, and we do that by putting specific receptors. This is the blue guys you see here on the top left picture. These blue guys, they are DNA receptors, and they will very specifically, if the DNA of interest is there, it will bind to these blue receptors that I put on the surface. So I can capture my DNA of interest on the surface. But still it's far too short, 50 nanometer. So we run a biochemical assay, it's called RCA, Rolling Circle Amplification. And what that does is that it takes this little strand of DNA and it makes copies of it, and it, hangs to, it concatenates its copies. So it goes like, it takes 50 nanometer and makes a copy, 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 a thousand times. So if a thousand times 50 nanometer, you get a strand of 50 micrometer. Yeah? Now we have a DNA strand almost the length of the thickness of a hair. And that's long enough for us, because that we can detect. So after we make this long 50 micrometer DNA, we pull it through the pores and bind it to the other side. So now I have contacted my DNA from one side of my membrane to the other side. And now I can try to electrically measure that. And I will measure nothing because it's not conductive. So I must take another step. I bind gold nanoparticles, again, very specifically to the DNA. And then I do a short electroplating, and that creates exactly these gold nanowires that go through. And now I can electrically detect whether this uh, DNA is there or not. I have a question. How do you get the DNA through the pore is the question. So the DNA, you can see here, DNA in solution will coil up itself because of van der Waals electrostatic act, act, actions. It, it likes to stay in some kind of, you can see it as a ball of wool, yeah? a long wire but co coupled together. And we know it likes to be in water, so what we do is we put a droplet of water on here and then we suck the water through the pore. And as the water goes through the pore, this DNA tries to stay in the water. But the water, you know, the interface of the water goes through and so most of the DNA is pulled through the pore down because it has to, it wants to follow the water until it comes on the other side and it will spontaneously bind there. Okay? So, that was the second example. 
The third example of uh, structures we make uh, is uh, spider silk nanostructures. And again, I will start with a movie. So this work is a close collaboration between my team and specifically my student Linnea, who's sitting in the corner. She can answer a lot of questions to you later if you want. And I work together with a team of Mu Hedhammer, who is associate professor in the School of Biotechnology. Now what Mu's team is specialized in is producing spider silk proteins. And how they do that is they, st oops, they start with extracting the DNA from a spider and implant that part of DNA. This is the part of the DNA of the, the part of the DNA of the spider that codes the protein, the, the spider silk protein. And so they implant this part of DNA into E. coli bacteria. This E. coli bacteria and the bioreactor start now producing this protein because they are coded to do that. And then they can extract that. This protein, by the way, we call spidroins. Silk proteins are called spidroins. So now we have they produce the spidroins. We can extract them, and then they come to us with a little vial of clear liquid and it's full of spidroids. And our task then in our lab, what we do is we start from that solution and we build structures out of it. And we use a specific, uh, well, first, Moose team is very smart because they not only take the spider silk, uh, the, sp the spider DNA, but they also change the DNA a little bit. So they put new types of DNA code at the end of it. And so, for example, they call it, you call it functionalizing DNA. And so doing that now, the the E. coli will produce spider silk with a specific function. For example, they make uh, spider silk with a fibronectin domain, and that's a biomolecular par part of a, of a protein that stimulates cell growth. So we'll be able to make now silk that stimulates cell growth. Another trick they do is to change the DNA, for example, to produce the uh, silk that uh, has a Z domain on it. And the Z domain is a part of a protein A. It's a, it's a protein is a type of a protein that binds antibodies. So now we make silk that will, by nature, start binding antibodies it sees around it. So we can biofunctionalize our silk in this way. So what we do is we start from the solution, and lucky for us, making structures is rather easy because what happens is that if you have a solution of spider silk protein, and if the solution has high enough concentration, the spidroins here in the solution, they will spontaneously self-assemble into silk film. On the top, on the surface. Silk films typically of a size 200 nanometer, 300 nanometer. Yeah. This is what happened. This is a little, this is a little cylinder, actually. And we have hanged that in a, in a, in a solution. It, I mean, it was dipped into this level here. And so what has happened is that we have formed a spider silk film inside this little seven millimeter diameter uh, cylinder. And this is a top view of the structure, and here you can see, actually, this is the spider silk film, and you can see we have put three metal bullets on it, and you can see how the spider silk film is really, you can see the, the, st the strain in the film. So we have a film that is only 200 nanometer thick. Yeah? So I see many of you here have a sandwich wrap. Paper, can I, can I get some, can I have this? Yeah, just give it away. So this is sandwich wrap, to give you an ID. You see this transparent part here? How thick is it, you think, this part here? Anybody has an idea? Is it as thick as human hair or thinner? What do you think? The same? Yeah, it's actually thinner. It's maybe 10 times as thin as human hair. So this kind of plastic foil is typically of the size 20, 50 micrometer. 
So the films we're making here are a hundred times thinner than this. But still, they're extremely, extremely strong. Thank you. So we're gonna see how strong they are by just loading metal bullets on them. And every bullet we add, we're gonna see that here, every bullet is 20 milligrams. And then you count them, okay? 20 milligrams. Forty. Now you can see the film here. See, it starts moving when you load something. Sixty. Eighty. One hundred. This is only two hundred nanometer thick, eh? so this is extremely strong. Oops! Now it breaks, and the spider still just could caught this one before it disappeared. Yeah. So we have an extremely strong, extremely thin layer. That's very interesting because this layer is also, it stimulates cell, cell growth because it has fibronectin on it. And so the first thing we can do then is of course do cell culture. This is a beautiful image of a cell culture at I think day two or day three, do you know that by heart? Day, day three, after seeding and we see we have a beautiful confluent layer of cells on this kind of structures. And so we want to develop this for tissue engineering purposes of course. The movie showed you also that we can make this type of nanowires. And what we can do, we can release these wires from this post and then they're free floating. And what we want to use that for is as drugs. Uh, for example, you can use them perhaps as anti-cancer drugs or as antimicrobial drugs. And the benefit of that is that these nanowires, they're biofunctionalized, but they remain for a long time in the body because your immune system has a hard time killing it because it's such a large structure. So uh, if you take a drug, a pill, a pill typically works maybe five hours, 10 hours, something, and then your body has destroyed it. But these can last for much, much longer. So. A fourth example of biohybrid structures we make is on the smaller scale I've shown. So the spider silk film and the DNA was at 200 nanometer. Now we go 10 times smaller, scale of 20 nanometer typically. Um, what, we do, what we do here is that we make very, very tiny structures of polymer, of plastic, a hard plastic, and we functionalize it with proteins. Now we do that is we start with a little wafer and put a droplet of the polymer as it's still in the liquid state, so before it crosslinks. We spin that so we create a very, very thin 20 nan 30 nanometer thick layer of polymer. And then we put it in a, an EB machine and write with an electron beam on the structure. And everywhere where the electrons hit the surface, they will trigger the, the, the crosslinking of the polymer and the polymer hardens. So with an, with an electron beam, we can write now a nano pattern in our structure. And the special thing here is that our polymer is not an, a normal polymer. Um, like for example, polymer structure here, this pen, this plastic. Plastic in everyday life is an inert material. Yeah? It doesn't stick, it doesn't react with anything. But the plastics that we make are specifically made to be reactive. So although it's a hard plastic, it has a surface that is reactive with tile molecules, so sulfur hydrogen bonds. And these bonds will readily interact with reactive species around them. And here we're going to exploit that, because once we have the structure, we flush biotin molecules. That's vitamin B, basically. We flush vitamin B over the surface, and the vitamin B binds on the surface spontaneously. And then if we add streptovidine proteins, everywhere where we had a pattern, automatically we create a pattern of proteins. And these proteins we're able to see because we have a little fluorophore that we put there. So in a fluorescent microscope, we're going to see the protein pattern. And this is what you see in the next image here. This is an image of our fractal tree. So everywhere where you see green, this is the green fluorescent proteins that light up in the microscope. And you see this, the black, this is just the bare silicon, and this is where we have the polymer with the protein. And the stem of the tree here is the thickness of a hair, 100 micrometer. And then the tree gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until its leaves, and in this particular tree, the leaves here, the smallest leaves have a size of 300 nanometer. You cannot see them with a the microscope because it's smaller than the wavelength of light, but they are there. So then we have to go to another type of microscope, an STM microscope or an AFM microscope. Then we can see, for example, details down to 20 nanometer, 30 nanometer that we can create with this kind of technology. Yeah. Four examples of biohybrid technologies we are doing in our lab. And now, interesting again, we go back to see how have we now combined our engineering skills with our biology skills. So we're now combining the different worlds 
you know, and taking properties from both sides and combining them in, in new structures. And of course, towards the future, what we want to do more and more is to, is to have more and more function and create more and more function and do a full integration. The last part of my lecture is about the future vision, the future vision of programmable matter. I will talk a little bit more what that is. And I will start again with a movie, a part of Big Hero 6. It doesn't look like much, but when it links up with the rest of its pals... So, this, ladies and gentlemen, is programmable matter. The idea of program programmable matter is to make objects and materials that can change both their shape and their properties by themselves. And I think that is a great challenge for us in the world of micro nano engineering because I think that's actually possible that we should be able to do that. I will tell you, this, is not, th this idea has been around for a while. Some people have tried it from different aspects, but I think people have tried to do it in the wrong way. And I have a new idea of how we should do that. And I want to talk a little bit about that here. So we can start again, the structure of biology. I think we always have to go back to biology because we are, we are the perfect, most perfect robots that exist in nature. Okay? So we should look at ourselves. How can we work? So we see we consist of cells. Remember how many cells? 40 trillion, yes. Cells. Cells build tissue, tissue build organs, organs build beautiful buildings. We call them trees. Also build fantastic robots, animals, or even humans ourselves. Yeah. So we are a living proof that you can build very complex structures out of small particles. And they're all identical. You have 40 trillion cells in your body, but only 200 different cell types. So very few cell types together make a very complex organism. So it is possible. We are living proof of that. And now the question you should ask yourself, if a, cell, a biological cell can do that, why can't we make artificial cells, put them together in artificial materials, and use that to build you know, synthetic buildings or robots with that? That's a key idea. And the first question we can ask ourselves, OK, how small, sh how small should we make these cells then? Okay? So one thing you can think, my, my take on this is that we should make these artificial cells actually quite a much the same as the size of a living cell. And there's a number of reasons for that. The first reason is you could think, why don't we make it much as small, small as possible? Well, of course, the smaller you make the cells, the higher resolution you can make of structure. Yeah? So if I have a, an object the size of a living cell, 10 micrometer, of course I cannot build a transistor with that, because I need nanostructures for that. So anything smaller than this scale I cannot build. So there's a natural thought we should make them as small as possible. However, the smaller you make them, the longer it will take, the longer time it will take to reconfigure such materials. Yeah? Because time scales with the power of third for the size. And I think, I'm not sure of that, but I think that there's also another fundamental limit that's even stronger, and that is that there's an, an entropic energy barrier to downscaling. Let me explain that. So I'm a structure consisting of 40 trillion cells, and my cells are in a very ordered structure, so you could say I'm a very ordered organism. My wife doesn't agree to that, but let us presume that I'm a very ordered person. Now I can take myself apart into 40 trillion cells, put them in a big vat, now I have a disordered system. Now I could take all these cells and put them back together into a person. So what I'm doing is I'm going from order to disorder, and back to order. That's what I need to do to reconfigure something. Now, order and disorder in physics is described by um, a concept called entropy. And if you know the second law of thermodynamics, over time, order systems always go to disorder. Yeah? Entropy increases with time. 
And if you want to reverse that, if you want to go from disorder back to order, you can do that, but only if you add energy to the system. And now it turns out to be so that the minimum amount of energy to, you need to create a certain amount of order, there's a fixed amount of energy you need for that, per amount of order. Yeah? And so the more particles I'm consisting of, the more order and disorder I have. So if I have like a gazillion particles, the amount of energy I'll need to reorder them is going to be much, much larger than if I have a small amount. Yeah? So that's going to be, I think, a fundamental limit to how small we can make the structures practically. It's just simply going to take too much energy to reconstruct something. And so perhaps this is the vision of programmable matter. Imagine at home you have a bucket of this kind of artificial cells. And now you want to go out in the evening and I want, I want that pair of red shoes. You know with high heels, very fancy. I tell, okay, build me the shoes, the bucket gives me the shoes, I put them on for the evening, and I come back home, I put them back in the bucket. And the day after, maybe it can make me a chair, or it can make me a t-shirt or something else. And why would, we, why would we do that? Why would we digitize the physical world? Because that's actually what we're doing, you know? We have, during the past 50 years, we have gone in the world of information from analog, sig analog signals and analog data, to digital data and digital signals. So we have gone from analog to digital. And why we can perhaps do the same with the physical world, go to a digital physical world, and that should open up for novel things that we cannot do today. A few examples. It would give us, if it works, ubiquitous access to goods. You have anything at any time that you wanted, you just create it on the spot. It's an ultimate sustainability because it's a perfect recycling system. You never need to buy anything new. The only thing you need is your bucket. There's an economy of scales. If everybody wants to have a bucket like that at home, this is going to be the most ever produced component in the history of the world. And it's going to be extremely cheap to make that because the more of something you make, the cheaper it becomes to make it. And finally, you also probably can make new applications. You can think of, for example, going on space explorations where you don't need to decide on forehand, will I drill into the planet or shovel something? No, you just send the bucket, you know, you, you decide when you're there. Or you can even think in, you know, in, maybe in, in, in medical technology, you know, why to replace a, a knee or a hip? You know, open the patient, put something new, close it, infection and so on. Maybe you can just in the future inject such cells and they can build it on the spot for you. And if they do that, why just rebuild it? Why not even make it better? So you get enhancing cyborg technologies. These are just dreams and potential things you could do with that. So and perhaps this is the, I would say, the, the final frontier in nanoengineering, trying to do that. Yeah. So I will stop my talk here. And if you have any questions, please. Yes? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So since it's very small and you want to program this material, and it's of course it's not the real material yet. So how the like how it works is not defined. But let, let's say it, it's there. How how, yeah. how small can it actually be to be programmable as well? Because you want communications with. No, stuff. you don't. So yeah. Well, yes well, and like no. How, how how will you control it? That, so that's now we can go. I I talked about this only for ten minutes now, but I've been thinking about that for three years. So there's more thought yeah, behind yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my take on that is that most people actually that come from the computer world, they see that, as you say, you have little units, and every unit is a smart unit. So and actually they do this kind of research. For example, at Harvard, MIT, they build small cube bots, the size pixels of or maxels here, the size of one centimeter that can roll on themselves, form snakes, form structures and so on. They can do that, hundreds of them. That exist today. But they're one centimeter in size. And these need to have both energy, communication, computing, sensing, and yeah, at least that. <laughs> and so it's very complex to build them and therefore you cannot downscale them. If you look at our own body, if I look at a cell in my finger, it's not very smart. I control my body with my brain. So rather than distributing the computing power in every little cell, and trying to have them work together, I would say we should rather look at organisms. And, and that's for, for the control, you should have a central brain and control stupid cells. And st having stupid cells is very good because it makes that you probably can build them already today in the lab. Building such cells, I mean, I showed the, the package cell, like the cell encapsulations, remember, for the cancer therapy? Take away the cells, put in a silicon piece, you have a building block here. And we have the Ostershell already around it, it's bonding, so we can bond cells together. So we can make this type of materials already in the lab if we wanted to. Of course, controlling them is a different thing. That's a part of the answer. <laughs> but, uh, yeah? The, the cube. cube. Okay. 
Um, I have no idea if that works. Yes. Yeah. Now I, I wanted to know: Do you do you do any research, or do you know any research that would you know harvest harvest the power of like let's say scale defect in nanotech? Uh, let's say, for example, if you take a living organism like a lower level of organization, would be the condition of existent of existence of an upper level of organization, which itself will be the reason why the lower level exists. So this is what I call this. Emergence. Effect. Exactly. You talk about emergence yeah. of functionality. Uh, is this something you work on or you harvest? Because it's like quite um, Not in an engineered manner, no. So the technologies I show, most of them, the first three I showed, are really focused on solving real biological problems today. And then we know what is the medical problem, and we engineer the most efficient solution for that, or what we think is the most efficient solution. Yeah? Um, emergence happens if you put a lot of particles together, like you have a lot of cells, and if they grow into tissue or into an organ, the function of an organ is very different than the function of an individual cell. That's what we call emergence of, emergence of function as structures come together. And this is not something that we do in our lab, no. no. But yeah, that is the concept you could think of. It. It's um, something that is difficult to control. It's something you observe. You put things together and then you observe, does something emerge or not? You can, it's very, very difficult to predict emergence. It's something you either observe it is there or it's not there. And so if you put a lot of particles together and you stir and you wait a long time, maybe you see something emerging. It would take a long time, I guess. But. Somebody in the back also. Watch out. Whoop. Wow. Good row. Uh, have you thought anything about like uh, radical life extension and things like that with the help of probes? If I think of that a lot, but I don't work on it, no. <laughs> Do you know anyone who works on it in this specific domain? Like, uh, uh, life extension. Of, no, this is not the domain I work in. But of course, there's a lot of research in that, looking at telomerases in cells and you know, make sure they don't get short. And, but that's definitely not what we're working on. What we're thinking, perhaps, this kind of building blocks, could they replace normal cells as kind of, okay, I have certain cells dying, can I replace them with an artificial cell? Maybe, but you know, living cells are so much better in doing what they're doing than anything we can manufacture today. So that's far away in the future, I'm afraid. Yeah, the microphone. Oh, second chance. So, uh, how would you mass produce these biological nano uh, systems? Biological? The the, the, like, I understand how you. These ones or which ones? N like, whichever. Because <laughs> I, there's like a s already like printing these stiff nano components that you make. like. No, you cannot print. So, printing, the smallest printing you can do today is maybe on the micrometer scale. And it takes a hell of a lot of time to make any structure with that. Okay. So it's possible, but it takes very long time. It's not very efficient. So what we showed the smallest structures was with E-beam. Yeah? The, the particles, for example, the particles for the, um, for the, like all the other particles are made much faster. Let's, let's see if, uh, let's see how I find that back here. Here. So these particles, for example, they are made very efficiently. So they are made in bulk. We can make them. We are now developing the technologies to make them 10,000 per minute, more or less. And so and we do that by droplet-based microfluidics. So we make small droplets. And it's a very beautiful process, actually. <laughs> it's very intricate. And uh, so we, we make technology to build this very quickly and very efficiently. In not, not one by one, but in en masse. And these structures also, you could see here, for example, we have an internship this summer, and she's going to look in upscaling this technology to make a couple of, to make enough wires for a drug within, say, a couple of minutes of time, using also, but just pure technology upscaling this kind of rolling of droplets over surfaces. So we're, we're on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please talk in the. Uh, no, it's just like yeah? curiosity because yeah, yeah. I, I know zero in biology. What happens to the, the like polymer? <laughs> I'm an electrical particle. engineer, by the way. So. <laughs> well, I swear. Yeah. I, I, that's why maybe it's like a very stupid question. Yeah. But the thing you produced, the first example, you know, the particles the, that would release a cell. Yeah. What happens to them after? Uh, what happens? Um, 
We don't know. We're going to uh, evaluate that. So you do, you do this for, uh, for cancers that you cannot treat in another way. Yeah? So before you do that, your patient is half dead, really. And then probably what happens is we can foresee that these particles, they will be released. The cells will die. They can survive for a while, but probably they'll die after a while. The particles will be released, probably in the bloodstream, and they'll get stuck probably somewhere in tissue. You have 10,000 very small plastic particles that are rather harmless somewhere into... Maybe they end up in the liver or in some scar tissue. We don't know that, but that's something for sure we're planning to investigate that. Yeah. But we don't see a major problem with that, I must say. Yeah. Your body can handle that, we hope. Yeah. Uh, is there some way to stay updated with your research? Like, do you have a blog or LinkedIn? Or um, my home page contains a few movies, and all the articles we um, write are there. You can see them. Uh, so what we publish, that's the best way, I think. Okay, if no more questions, thank you. <laughs>